Welcome. In this video we look at 3.6, derivatives as rates of change. I like this section. We take a step back from our calculational tools, uh, just our different formulas and shortcuts for taking derivatives, and we think about the question, what does the derivative of a function really mean? We see some word problems and we think about application of derivatives. So rates of change. Geometrically, we've been thinking of the derivative as the slope of a tangent line, but in real world situations, that slope of a tangent line translates into a rate of change. How about in the context of position? If f of t gives the position, say in meters, of an object after t seconds, then f prime of t is measured in what? What are the units for f prime of t? So we might think that f prime is like the derivative with respect to t of f, or we might write df dt. And this gives us a clue to thinking about the units, because the function f gives us position in meters, so that's meters. And t is measured in seconds, so meters per second. So whereas f is measured in meters, f prime is measured in meters per second. F the f, the original function f, it will give us the position of an object, and f prime will give us the velocity of the object. And, incidentally, f double prime gives us the acceleration of an object. We use derivatives in the context of cost. Let's suppose that c of x is the cost in dollars of producing x items. The derivative, c prime of x, is called the marginal cost. So if I took the derivative of a cost function, let's see, that would be dc dx. C is measured in dollars, and x is just counting the number of items. So dollars per item. And that brings us to this second bullet point. If c, uh, c prime of x is the cost to produce the x plus first item. It's a rate of change. It says as x increases, say as x increases by one, how much will the cost increase, the total cost? So it is the cost to produce the x plus first item. And many, many other contexts. Any time in the real world where there is a rate of change, there is a derivative lurking somewhere in the background. Let's suppose that, say, d of x is the cost in dollars of drilling x meters into the ground. How is d prime of x measured? Right, so d d over d x. In this case, uh, the capital D is dollars, and my x is in meters. So when I take a derivative of this function, it tells me how many dollars per meter it will cost to drill. Just as an example, let's say I have d prime of 22 equals 50. How do I interpret that? This tells me that if we're drilling into the ground and we're already 22 meters in, then at that point, each additional meter, you know, around the point where I've already drilled 22 in, each additional meter will cost me $50. At that point, it is $50 per meter. Okay, for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to go through three examples, position, cost, and population. In past videos, I have told you explicitly, pause and try the problem, and then unpause again when you're ready to check your work. I'm not going to do that in this case, but in general, do that throughout these problems. Uh, challenge yourself, pause the video many times, see if you can figure out what the solutions are before I present them on the, uh, in the video here. Okay, let's get to it. First example, position. An object thrown vertically upward from the surface of a celestial body at a velocity of 27 meters per second reaches a height of s equals negative 0.3 t squared plus 27 t meters in t seconds. There are lots of questions that we can ask about this situation. Determine the velocity, v, of the object after t seconds. When does the object reach its highest point? What is the height of the object at the highest point? When does the object strike the ground? With what velocity does the object strike the ground? On what intervals is the speed increasing? So we can answer all of these questions and we'll do it, uh, we'll do them one by one. So let's take the first three questions. All right, so A, let's determine the velocity of the object after t seconds. How do we do this? Well, that's really looking at my position function, my height function, and taking the derivative of that, because velocity is the derivative of position. 
And there we go. So how about B? When does the object reach its highest point? And maybe this is a little tricky. When does the object reach its highest point? Well, this is sort of the picture I'm thinking of in my mind. This object is thrown up, it goes up and then comes back down and hits the ground. Um, I have time on my horizontal axis and height on the vertical axis. And I want to know this time right in the middle. When does it reach its highest point? This is when I focus on velocity. Because at the beginning of this process, the velocity is positive, And then the object goes up, the velocity becomes zero, and then as the object falls, the velocity becomes negative. So basically, I really just want to figure out when does the velocity equal zero? So when the velocity is zero, and, we so, and so we solve the equation, negative 0.6 t plus 27 equals zero. I don't plug in zero for t. I'm actually solving the equation v of t equals zero. And when I solve this, we find that the answer is 45. So at 45 seconds, the object is at its highest point. So what is the height of the object at the highest point? What do I need to do now to figure that out? This is a question about height, not velocity. So I need to use my height function. And I need to actually evaluate the height function at 45 seconds. So evaluate s when t is 45. And we find that the answer is 607.5. So if I came across, I'd have 607.5 there. Three more questions on this same problem. D, when does the object strike the ground? So this again seems like a question about height. So I need to figure out when is the height zero. So we're solving an equation. We want to solve s equals zero. And so when I do that, I find that there are two solutions, t equals zero or t equals 90. Because in the picture, there are two moments in time when the height is, when the height is zero, time zero and time 90. Perhaps 90 makes a little sense because this is a nice symmetric graph. And we saw earlier that the height, uh, the object reached its highest point at 45 seconds. With what velocity does the object strike the ground? So I know the time when it strikes at 90. So now all I need to do is plug 90 into my velocity function. Evaluate v at t equals 90. And we find that the answer is negative 27 meters per second. And maybe that should make a little sense, because recall from the problem, the initial velocity of this object, the initial upward velocity, was 27 meters per second. So it's like I had a tangent line right at the beginning. The slope of that tangent line is 27. And if I put a tangent line right at the very end, the slope of that tangent line would be negative 27. Last question, on what intervals is the speed increasing? And there's no real calculation here, but just a matter of thinking about the physical situation. When the object is launched, it slows down, slows down, slows down until 45 seconds when it reaches the highest point. And then as it falls, it increases speed. So from when it falls to when it hits, from the highest point to when it hits the ground, that is the interval on which the speed is increasing. In general, for what it's worth, you can always tell when the speed is increasing. This is when uh, your first derivative and second derivative both have the same sign. They're either both positive or they're both negative. So when velocity and acceleration are both positive, an object is increasing speed in the positive direction. When velocity and acceleration are both negative, then the object is increasing speed in the negative direction. And that's the situation here for problem F, that my velocity is negative and my acceleration is also negative. All right, let's try our next example. Cost. Your company manufactures headphones, and your cost function to produce X headphones is that thing right there. And there's this little note for X between zero and a thousand. So this cost function is valid for this particular domain, as long as X isn't too big, X between zero and a thousand. Some questions we might ask here. What is the average cost function, the marginal cost function? We can plug 100 into all of these different functions. What do they mean? All right, we'll take the first two problems. So the average cost function. Average cost is the cost of all the items divided by the number of items. So in fact, we have c bar of x 
that, that will be C of X divided by X. So the total cost for producing all X items divided by the number of items. So in our case, then we find out, we do the calculation. You can see the work there. Uh, we get an expression for the average cost of producing X items. Now let's turn our attention to B, find the marginal cost. So that's basically just the derivative. That's actually a little bit easier to calculate, at least now that we know calculus. Finding the marginal cost gives us an answer of negative uh, 0.04x plus 50. And now we interpret these results. Okay, how do I calculate and interpret C of 100? So if I plug in 100 into my original cost function, I get $4,900. This is the total cost to produce 100 headphones. Now these things get more interesting. How do I calculate and interpret C bar of 100? I'll plug 100 into the C bar function, and that ends up being $49 per headphone. So that means when I've produced 100 headphones, then the average cost for each headphone that I've produced is $49. When making 100 headphones, the average cost per headphone is $49. Now, it's interesting to compare that with the answer for, for part E. The marginal cost at 100. C prime of 100 is $46 per headphone. And we think about that when making 100 headphones, the cost to make one more is $46. Why is there this difference? $49 per headphone for the average cost, $46 per headphone for the marginal cost. The idea is this. When calculating the average, I'm taking all the headphones that I've made into consideration. And also, there are upfront costs. Right at the beginning of this process, when x equals 0, it costs $100 just in upfront cost, right? Do you see if you plug in 0 in for x in my original function, it's 100. So there are upfront costs to producing headphones. And this average value takes those upfront costs into consideration. However, with marginal costs, it's only thinking about one item to the next after you know producing one more headphone, producing one more headphone. And for the marginal cost, when I'm at 100 headphones already, the cost to make the next one is 46. So since it doesn't take the upfront costs into, it, into account, uh, the marginal cost is going to be a little bit less than the average cost. All right, let's move on to our last example, population. The population in thousands of a certain state from 1991 t equals 0 to 2001 t equals 10 is modeled by the polynomial p of t equals all that stuff. Some questions we might ask. What it was the average growth rate from 2004 to 2010? What was the growth rate in 2004? What was the growth rate in 2010? And how do we interpret these results? Okay, A. What was the average growth rate from 2004 to 2010? That's uh, from t equals 3 to t equals 10. Do you think you know how you might calculate this? At one point we found formulas for an average rate of change, and that will be p of 10 minus p of 3 divided by 10 minus 3. It's very much like that uh, formula for the slope of a secant line that we found at one point geometrically. So when I do that calculation, uh, over the course of seven years, we find that the average growth rate is 146.1 thousand people per year. It was the average growth rate over the course of the seven years. For B, what was the actual growth rate in 2004? How do I calculate that? This is where I need the derivative. So I take the derivative of P and plug in 3. And it turns out that P prime of 3 is 148.2 thousand people per year. We can do the same process for C, the growth rate in 2010. P prime of 10 is 144,000 people per year. And then D, how do you interpret this? So look at this. In 2004, the growth rate was 148.2 thousand people per year. 
In 2010, seven years later, the growth rate was 144,000 people per year. Both of those numbers are positive. The population in this state is growing, but look what's happened. It has decreased from 148.2 down to 144. So even though the population of this state is increasing, the rate of increase, the rate of growth is dropping. Population is increasing, but the rate of growth is dropping. And finally, it should also make sense that the average is somewhere in between those two numbers. All right, so this does it for 3.6 derivatives as rates of change. This is really why we do calculus. We do it for the application uh, because rates of change are everywhere around us in the world. So anywhere you look, anytime you see a rate of change, there's a derivative there somewhere, and that makes a good conclusion to this section.